Hello ladies and gentlemen, what is up? My name is Karan Dharamsi and welcome to the first episode of Conversations with TMN. And on this episode, we have with us Dr. Himang Shah, who is an innovator and an IP expert. Sundar Valicha and I discussed a lot of things with Dr. Himang Shah, right from talking about the design thinking process where Dr. Himang Shah was really kind enough to lay out his entire five-step framework to implement design thinking into your life and your business. And he also was generous enough to share a lot of free resources to protect your intellectual property. And as a fellow business owner, I'm sure you realize the importance of protecting your intellectual property. And if that's the reason why you're watching this episode, then I suggest that you skip towards the end because that's where we get into the conversation about protecting your intellectual property. Let's begin the conversation with TMN episode number one. Hi, Hemang. How are you? Well, I'm doing well. Uh, Sandhya, Karan, thanks for having me. Well, fabulous. Now, you're a coffee lover. Karan is a coffee lover. You're in Bengaluru. He spent his college days there. Now, what's going on? Did you guys plan this out? I feel outnumbered. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good coincidence. But yeah, coffee is a, is a good, uh, I guess, leveler. It brings people together. <laughs> for those who are unversed, Tell us more about the concept of design thinking. You're a practitioner of it, right? So I stumbled upon this approach called design thinking. Like over the years, I would I was leading the different brainstorming groups. And the idea was that everyone's going to have lunch, right? We all eat every day. So we said, okay, why don't every two weeks, you know, we get together. And instead of just talking about random things, why don't we solve a problem, you know, using our collective experiences. So the idea was to involve different people, different uh, people's strengths, uh, and to, you know, I guess, have fun while while we're solving a problem together. And we kept on doing this over time. And later I realized that hey, this approach, what we are doing, what we get about is actually called design thinking. It's a great way to bring about innovations in a very easy manner that it doesn't look at what your background is. It doesn't look at what your expertise is. It doesn't even care about what field you are in. So I've used design thinking to solve innovations in the area of technology. I've done my career planning that way. Uh, I've, I've used it for a variety of personal problems, help people in different in industries. So I think it's an amazing way for anyone who wants to bring about breakthrough products and services. How exactly did you stumble upon design thinking as a concept? So I stumbled upon by doing it, you know, because we started uh, a group where, so design thinking, is a five-step framework. You know, I'll, I'll just say what those are. Those are uh, empathy, define, ideate, test, uh, ideate, prototype, and test. Uh, and none of this is rocket science. You know, right. in the first phase, what you're trying to do is you're trying to understand what problem is my customer facing. Your customer could be anyone, right? Like for a yes. husband, the customer could be, let's say, the family because he's trying to solve a problem for them. Uh, if you're a company, it's it's for your consumers. You try to look at, okay, what does their world feel like? Then from that, you analyze patterns and you define one problem that we have to attack. And to solve that one problem, you come up with as many solutions as possible. So that's where you ideate with a diverse group. You bring multiple perspectives together. Now, from the forest of ideas that you've generated, you pick one or at the best two parts that you're like, hey, I'm going to create basic mock-ups. You know, if I use the Hindi words, sasta. You know, like past and you know, something which shows that hey, this prototype can you know, kind of give us an indication that this idea can go. Right. Once you're happy with it, you test it out on your ideal customer. Once you get that feedback, then you refine it over. But that, in a sense, is design thinking. And we were doing things, you know, just for ideation purposes, just to attack it. And over time, I figured out that hey, there is a better way to apply this framework. So that's how my journey started. Since your goal is to help folks innovate, so what steps or roadmap would you give to a startup entrepreneur who just approaches you and wants your guidance about it? So startups are working in a very interesting space. And this earlier this afternoon, I had a discussion with one of the founders. It's very easy to get caught up in what you're building, right? that you're so focused on delivering something that sometimes you get lost off What's your true purpose? So my first step to any startup is like, let's take a step back and look at 
what is it that you're trying to achieve who is it that you're solving for have you understood that the problem is real because a lot of times startups or founders are very passionate about a particular tool and they want to apply that tool to anything that you know they see around them right but in reality if you solve for the customer it's the other way around you look at what their biggest problem is that's step number one that's how we get started on any design thinking journey because if your assumptions over there are incorrect then everything else that you do it doesn't matter correct so that's step number one that's how i would suggest anyone like understand your customer in whichever way possible try to get as much detail about them what their pain points are how they are using ex- existing products how how can you better improve their emotional needs so that's step number one makes sense so in marketing generally we start with you know market selection selecting the right market is really important and i think the second logical step is you know understanding the pain points of the market and trying to solve the right uh, problems for the market and i think that's where design thinking is so important true a uh, lot of times uh, people are just looking at the data they like okay here is what the trend uh, here is what's trending like in the market and they just jump and act on it uh, what sometimes is uh, really beneficial if you have the time is to under extract the uh, emotional attributes to it so let's say if you are trying to make an online payment on something uh, and there's some point where you will be frustrated so you will express emotions those are never captured in any marketing survey okay. but that takes a lot of time to uh, extract that information right. so i think that's the the root uh, i guess source for uh, a design thinking journey so you've helped and inspired the startups in india to design products that leverage ai could you tell us more about the startups that you've helped and the ones that you plan to help sure so i've been working in my professional capacity uh, with startups in the hardware and iot space and it's a fun space to you know be a part of i mean seeing it in india for the last 5 uh, or 6 years now uh, i've first and worked with 100 plus startups and you know i have seen numerous more so the shift is really amazing that when we started this journey in 2016 you would see startup that were slowly beginning to think that hey we want to introduce certain products in the market and now five years on we are seeing products which are being launched in the area of robotics drones medical devices uh, electric vehicles infotainment like in vehicle infotainment like many many more areas a shift is amazing because well firstly india has a thriving ecosystem of engineers we always had that alongside that the startup ecosystem has received a lot of you know i guess what you they call it funding boost uh, there's the ecosystem which has developed and not just the founders but also people like corporates and venture capital and evangelists who are supporting them so that journey in looking at how startups are able to get talent and solve amazing problems is really fun to see if i could roll back a little bit towards your career so when you were studying and you know you uh, in your academic journey so did you always have that clarity that hey i want to you know eventually go to this path because i think at that point the startup culture wasn't that big in india right so how did you transition into this or was it always the plan well, thank you no, i didn't plan any of that I, i just stumbled across amazing roles like i come well if i have to start i come from a pakka gujarati business family where i was supposed to join the gaddi you know and uh, i was one of those i guess the black sheep who enjoyed studies and who really like learning about new things i, I love science and technology so my goal was okay just to get my bachelor's that turn into a masters which eventually turn into a doctorate and alongside i had only one goal am i learning enough uh, and am i having fun with what i'm learning is it is it is it extending me uh, from an intellectual perspective uh, do i have an opportunity to create an impact i just kept those things as my kind of like compass in which i chose different roles uh, whether it is career journeys or even geographical journeys and one thing just started leading to another so i i wish i could tell you that hey gives a blueprint for anyone to follow but there isn't <laughs> just how your phd and your education 
helped you out in your journey do you want to see a change do you want to be a part of that change where you felt it was fun learning so some things that you learned imbibed maybe document that and share in the educational system itself from the young age for students out there we love our education system maybe it was rigorous and i, I agree it's not right for everyone like there are misfits you know for whom our education system might be uh, too constrictive and and it's i i see why that happens uh, but there are things which i learn i and i didn't even think that i would be using those things so for example uh, there was this topic of material science which we had in my telecom engineering course and all of us were wondering like where are we going to use this material and 5 years later when i'm doing my doctorate i had to do 70% of my work was material science all that stuff which i had kind of left for my study leave so sort of came back you know rushing all together so i i think you know there was some method to that madness that we call as our education system it, it does click through uh, and i think the x factor which our education system prepares one for is that uh, there is no right path you know there is it's a competitive landscape and you have to figure out your own path through it so if you if you come through our system i think you can be successful anywhere else <laughs> uh, having said that Uh, our education system is changing for the better like i know i know for example the ministry of education has launched this atal ranking for innovation in uh, educational institutes including colleges so i've had my engineering alma mater reach out to me where we've done education courses on innovation on intellectual property because they are being rated for that uh, design thinking is going to be introduced from class i think 8 onwards for cbse curriculum it's going to be an elective subject so imagine the impact it's going to have on the future innovators from india i mean it's remarkable so they are making steps yeah i agree it may not be as rapid as we want it but i like our system for what it is and and like job says i think eventually the dots will connect yeah i think everything that you learn never goes for a waste and they always do you look at at various people over the years uh, somehow you know they make it even the ones who hated the system They're like yeah i know what i struggle through it but that has prepared me for life i i did my engineering in computer science and i hated it i was like i'm never going to take up an it job and where am i going to know study about databases and apply it in my real life but eventually when i started a marketing agency a digital marketing agency all that came back because all that is now really helping me in my data and you know creating marketing campaigns so i think yeah it did work <laughs> <laughs> So while we are talking about education a uh, one book that really transformed your life inspired you like anything that people should really read for sure there are many many books which i have read over the years uh, one of the early business books which i read was in pursuit of excellence uh, there is another business book which has a lot of case studies that is called from good to great and why i love these books especially good to great is that a lot of times the enemy of most of, of our pursuits is getting stuck at good mm-hmm. we are happy with good enough and we don't push ourselves to reach the next level and if you look at that philosophy uh, it permeates the corporations also because corporations are just individuals working together and so if individuals are happy being stuck at good you know some corporations will have their results which are just good enough and they won't see what they are capable of So I think these two were were really remarkable. One of the recent books which I'm very happy with is called Small is Big, and the idea of this book is that it tells how we can achieve huge results by just making small changes to our life. Very impactful and very practical. And uh, I again want to loop back to design thinking as a concept. So could you give an example of where you no know, in your life maybe you were stuck with a challenge? and you used the design thinking concept to overcome that challenge and you know it really helped you like uh, you just gave an example go from good to great in terms of uh, i'll say how i was uh, applying it towards uh, my studies uh, particularly when i was a doctorate student if i, if I look at that i i sort of applied it that way now most uh, doctorate studies you know try to look for is that someone assigns you a problem and that person tends to be your uh, advisor you know who's who's going to play a big role in your life and we were working at this area of merging of 
two disciplines. Uh, it was uh, material science and it was uh, electronics and optics engineering. Now, from all these things, we had to collect what our observations were from a scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. But from an individual perspective, I have also had to figure out what my traits were. Because you could, let's say, figure out that, hey, am I a theoretical person or am I more of an experimentalist? And you really don't know that from the outset until and unless you try out various things. So those were, I would say, the soft skills or the emotional aspects which started uh, being applied alongside this rigorous literature search that we started. And from that point onwards, we started figuring out, okay, what is the key problem to solve? What's going to make an impact, not just to the scientific community, but hopefully to an industry. And this industry was the display industry where uh, what we were doing would have applied to LCD technology, that use of flat screen TVs. And from that point onwards, we started looking at ideating what are the different approaches we could do, experiments that we could take. Uh, and naturally, in research, you'll have a lot of prototypes, you'll have a lot of tests. So that was like a real life design thinking cycle. And we kept on iterating that. But the beauty is we didn't know that we were doing the design thinking cycle. So now that I reflect back, I can see how, how that framework you know, really played a big role. It would be right to say that design thinking, one of the core aspects of it would be to ask the right questions. Because I think asking the right questions would lead to prob solutions or thinking about problems that you know, somebody has never thought about and then following the framework. Very well said. It, but the goal is it won't get you there. If you follow the steps, you will figure out that, okay, what is the right question to ask? So uh, design thinking ultimately is, is meant to create this product at the end of the journey. But if you want to create this impactful product, eventually you will you'll figure out that, okay, in my analysis and my observations of who am I solving for, what is the right question to ask? And, and one of the stages you know, in the defined phase, one of the exercises that I recommend people to do is to do a needs analysis. Okay, so I'll just take a bit of time and, and tell you what those are. So every product, I have a glass of water in my hand. Uh, it, this, gla this glass has or fulfills uh, certain needs. There's a primary need where well, it should hold water, right? Meaning it should have the right size to, to hold water. There's a secondary need wherein you know, it should, let's say, uh, fit my hand or something. And then there is something called as latent need. And this is a need that no one else is expressing, but it makes a big difference to the end user. Okay, so for example, in uh, decorative uh, aspects and all that, it could be a certain design which appeals to uh, certain high-end places. Yeah. But it, it's, it won't, let's say, the latent need for you will vary from that for a kid. When my kid will look at this glass, they'll say, okay, this is a boring glass. For them, their glass is something which holds uh, fishes and other animated characters on the outside. Again, the kid will never tell you that I want this in my glass. So a latent need is rarely expressed by the consumer. But if you understand that, okay, you know what? If I have to get my kids to drink water, this is a need that they're not expressing. And if I hit that, then no matter what, they will always use that glass. So that's how you would get to the right question to ask or the right problem to solve. If you were to give advice to your younger self, what advice will you give? I won't give my younger self any advice. I think that journey that uh, I took you know, made me who I am today. And I'm very happy with that. Made mistakes. I had a lot of fun. Uh, met good people. And I think all of that was just by being in that flow, by not over planning a lot of things. So, yeah, I mean, just the idea is, is go with the flow. Uh, things will happen. Most of them will happen for the good. So you spoke about mistakes. So any one mistake that a startup entrepreneur must stay away from that you experienced in your journey, but somebody else can learn from it and steer away and maybe save years of turmoil and move towards success faster. You made, made many over the years and if I look at the mistakes where I've learned from a whole lot, uh, I think the trend which applies to them is that I overestimated either my capabilities or I assumed too much. So I'll again draw an example from my research journey. And, uh, at one of the top research conferences, I'm meeting, let's say, one idol like whose papers I've read over the years. And you're, you're having 
lunch with this person like it's like not like a dream come true but like something that you're looking for i get for. it in my mind dream come true <laughs> yeah. but i get it yeah yeah <laughs> and this person uh you know he looks at my research project which i was doing at that time and it was not my main project it was one of the elements of that and his feedback was very brutal to me at the time it's like this stuff does not matter and you know for someone who's put so much of passion energy into that and is meeting their idol you know was that like a very crushing blow and in hindsight you know i he's like the industry will never accept that solution and he was right and i could not figure out why that was the case now years later when i went into the industry when i started working in the industry what he said made sense so that was a mistake which which i did and that was assuming that my solution will make an immediate impact to the industry and i did not think that i did not think for the industry you know i did not think how many how much stuff that they would have to change at their end to adopt that solution what all uh, i guess effort that they would have to put before they start enjoying the fruits of, of my changes i overestimated that and i made the wrong assumptions so i think those are things which again they happen for the good it was a crushing blow that project was impactful from a research perspective but i wanted to see it being adopted on a much wider scale that's where i made a mistake great and since you just spoke about getting that brutal feedback but in the hindsight it held that it was true so when you were working with startups are you, you know, do you actually give brutal honest feedback and sometimes do you see you know if you're not being very brutal and straight to the point you see that you no know, founders sometimes do not take that feed the thought process very seriously and adopt it so how do you go, go about working with the startups i try to explain the significance of where i'm coming from so even if i have to tell someone that this will not work uh, i i could make that statement and you know they can you know, think about it for themselves but i don't think that's effective i think it's much better if i tell them why i'm making that statement you know what are what are my assumptions what are my reasonings behind that uh, and what i feel uh, like is it a loss cause you know in the have they gone on a journey where it's at a point of no return that's never happened by the way but it's more of a course correction that hey, you went on this path i don't think this is let's say a solution which will scale as you get into production maybe if you consider this other approach which i'm talking about and and ultimately it's the founders who have to make that decision so my role is that like an advisor where i'm like hey, this is what i'm seeing based on what i know but of course they know their market they've done their study and it's their call so yeah giving a statement like that is not effective i think it's much better to provide the reasoning and the logic behind it while you're working with startups are you also seeing that you know the design thinking process is being adopted by different teams like marketing and you no know, startups uh, are all over the place you know some have have very good structures uh, like they have a team which follows things methodically and uh, i won't say they if they are using design thinking i won't say they they particularly call it like that but you can see the way they run their operations you can feel like you know things are uh, being done in a right way but i've also met a fair share of, of startups that are too lost into their own world like they've gone on a path they're happy with with you know their own solution and they're trying to refine it but sometimes uh, you know you have to kind of nudge them and say Hey, have you spoken to your customers like how, how do you know whether this is really what they are looking for like what is the validation behind that are you continually continually polling on that so every startup is different and but the good part is because of the ecosystem they tend to talk amongst each other so even if someone is not deliberately doing it just by being at so many networking events just by talking inherently they get a chance to you know validate you know what they are trying to build we usually talk about uh, professional life you know the work that we do so what's your purpose and the larger vision for your life over the years i have uh, learned how to in- innovate you know, right. through different folks like i would say to my teachers and more so from uh, my uh, my doctorate studies the advisors that i had they really inculcated a desire to innovate and even the 
uh, the company I work for, you know, they have a fabulous culture. So my goal over the years now has become, I want to help people innovate. You know, because all of us are, sometimes we don't know how to go about it. And a lot of us make an assumption that hey, to come up with an innovation uh, requires certain degrees. It requires certain skill sets, which I don't have. And that's why I cannot innovate. And I'm like, all that is BS. You know, all you really need at the end of the day is a passion to solve a problem. And I have an easy way to help you get there. So my purpose is to, is to really help anyone and everyone. My goal is I can help one person innovate and successful you know, for that day. That's amazing. And um, we work with a lot of startups and you know, a lot of startups uh, and especially SMEs, I wouldn't say you know, a lot of startups, but SMEs majorly, you know, that's where our focus is and we like helping them grow. So now when we speak to a lot of SMEs, you know, in their approach, they're like, we cannot innovate so much because we lack funding and we don't have venture VC funding and all that. So we are limited by budget. But I always tell them that, hey, you can still innovate. Innovation is, doesn't come through money. So what would you like to say to the SME business owners? Because we have a lot of them in our network who you know, watch our videos and read our emails and read our blogs. So I fully agree with you, firstly. Like, innovation doesn't mean that you need capital to make it happen. Innovation really means creating a wow experience. That, that's as simply as I like to put it. And that wow experience applies in a variety of levels. It could be in a product which you're making, but could also be a process which you follow. Maybe in how you follow up with your customers. Maybe how you market. You know, and a lot of times SMEs are great at, let's say, doing their business operations. But a major improvement, at least which I see, you know, coming back from the textile industry, the textile wholesale industry, they don't really talk about how they are bringing out new products. They don't talk about the new innovations that they are bringing, let's say, in, in different textiles that are introduced in the market. So an innovation could be just simply how you market it to customers or how you do outreach. So you can innovate in a variety of areas and none of those really require capital. But yeah, it requires your time commitment. So this whole equation of time is equal to money. You have to, you have to be willing to put that effort. Yes, there will be certain areas where you might want to buy certain tools or, or adopt certain processes, but that can come later. So when he and, mentioned uh, textile, did you have visuals of your uh, clients from yeah, Surat? <laughs> because we work with a lot of clients from Surat marketplace and you know, since Surat is the hub of textile. So we have a lot of e-commerce clients. And so it just <laughs> it <did. laughs> took me. Yeah. And what are your thoughts about uh, work-life balance? I mean, are you somebody who believes that there should be a balance between your personal and professional life? Or are you somebody who's very hardcore that you know, life is all about work? Uh, so I, I read this somewhere. Uh, have you all uh, been on a seesaw when you were yeah. kids? Yeah. Right? So this is like a, like a seesaw, right? Uh, yeah. Like it's going to keep you let's say steady right is it fun this way yeah if you put two cats on each side is it really fun? It's, it's more fun when this happens right uh, so, so i think it, it does matter right if it's uh it's also by the way it's also not fun if it's just stuck on either place yeah right so you want a, a bit of that so my engineer method uh, engineer i guess visualization is that it's like a sine wave you know if you have it in waves, there'll be certain times when your life takes over and you should allow for that. And there'll be certain times when your work takes over. And if you're having fun, if you're, if you're keeping yourself in a good mental state, then you'll be completely fine with all these variations. But yeah, if it's stuck in either one, then it's boring. <laughs> uh, what do you do generally to unwind? I love to bake. Wow. So yeah, I love to bake. I uh, I think working with dough gives me a just a nice. It takes me back to my material science days, where you know baking is is a very precise thing. You know, you you can't just hand wave around it. You've got to measure what you know, measure every ingredient. You've got to uh, knead the dough well, uh, and then you've got to put it in the, in the oven and kind of have to let it happen. You know, let it take. You can't meddle too much with it. But I find that entire process you know very relaxing. So I do that. Uh, I've been a sports nut for as far as I can remember. 
So something which I've been doing these days is uh, I've been podcasting, bringing inspiration from the world of sports to innovation. And because I think sports imitates life, but I also believe life can imitate a lot of things that we do on the sports field. Right. So yeah, that's a fun experiment which I've been you know trying for a couple of years now. So wow. yeah, tell me more about yeah. innovation, sports, and life. Thank you. You've done your homework. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that that's been an idea which I've been living with for a number of years. Like I I always find uh, sports people's journeys very inspirational, no matter whoever it is. So just before this call, I was uh, reading Akshar Patel's interview, you know, the the left left arm spinner, and it's inspiring how he made the journey from like he used to play sports just for fun as a happy go lucky kid, not you know, with any seriousness. And his grandmother's ambition was to see him in the on TV once, you know, wearing the India blue jersey. Unfortunately, she passed away, and he made a promise to his dad that even if it's for only one match, I will wear the India blue jersey, and I'll be on TV. And so that changed his complete outlook, and he turned his passion and merged it with focus. And a lot of us can do that, right? Because we are passionate about a variety of things. We sometimes lack the focus. So if you take an inspiration from, hey, this guy can do it, and if he can prove it on the on on the screen every day, like if you watch IPL or India matches, he's done fabulously. And if, if he can do it, why can't we? So that influences life. We also see, let's say, uh, how people analyze uh, different things. You know, like if you watch IPL. There are matchups. You can see how a player is trying to win over the other team, you know, by by just planning like, yeah, hey, got to come up with a different delivery, different game plan. Right. So they are innovating. We are seeing their experiments on screen. So I think there's a natural merge of of how sports can influence innovation. So I'm exploring the journey, talking to different people. So I've interviewed someone who's climbed, uh, who summited Mount Everest twice. Uh, while following a completely vegan lifestyle, including his equipment, like you know, he went to that level. Uh, I've interviewed someone who's been a former India pro tennis player, and now she's working with startups. So exploring different journeys and trying to see, okay, what can something from their life influence our world? Uh, I can so relate to this because. No, the way we run our company, when somebody new joins the company, the first thing I give the example of, I tell them that think of our company as the cricket team. So everybody here has to, you know, bring in their A game because there are so many players waiting out there to, you know, grab that spot of eleven. And you are here, so you, and we all think like we are playing for the India national team. So we need to bring in that game. If you are not performing for four or five matches. You know, you're probably going to get dropped, right? So that's the metaphor I like to give, and I like to operate on. So I can so relate to this. So when you are doing this, you're talking to a lot of people, and you, I'm sure, read a lot about sports and follow a lot of sports people. So whose journey has been the most inspiring for you as a sportsman? So over the years, if I look at it, I really love Novak Djokovic's uh, journey. I mean, just having seen his uh, tenacity and the way he He prepares uh, the the physical shape that he's in, uh, and you know it's not like he's this bulked up person. And, and he's also a believer in yoga and on the spiritual meditation side of things. So I think his journey has been uh, very inspiring over the years. Uh, I'm a big Sachin Tendulkar fan. Like I mean, as talented as he is, I, you know the countless stories of how hard he's worked to practice his craft. Uh, so he's he's someone I really really uh, have admired over the years. I I completely agree about Sachin. I, I even had a Facebook when he retired. The God uh, Sachin Tendulkar is God, and God retired today. So and <laughs> when I look back, you know I'm a big cricket fan. So now I stopped watching cricket dramatically after Sachin retired, and Virat got my interest again into cricket. But when I compare the journey of uh, Vinod Kamli and Sachin, I think Vinod scored heavily, way more than Sachin. But I think the attitude and you know the the entire hard work. I, I don't know what went wrong, but I think that's where Sachin shines. Uh, 
completely a relax. Uh, Sachin, the way he's handled the pressure over the years. Sometimes for fun, I'll, I'll go to YouTube and uh, search for this clip where the entire stadium is shouting Sachin, Sachin. I don't think any any other player can gather that love which he did, and the pressure of literally a billion fans and still perform. Yeah. And the guy found a way to perform so many times. So, so I think there is something you have to admire for him how he's worked. Uh, not just on his physical aspect, even things like you know he went through this test match without scoring on the offside, or like how he prepared for Shane Warne when uh, you know that Australian team was visiting India, and how he practiced in you know hitting Shane Warne when he would bowl from the rough. Alongside that, his mental preparation. So I mean, stories like those have influenced me, and I'm like hey, I want to keep learning that. I want to keep exploring that. True. True, and I think his best example of uh, work ethic would be when his dad passed away, and he still went back and you know played that match. I mean that that moment still lives with me. I'm like, man, that's the sign of greatness. Can't agree more with you. <laughs> I'm sorry, we got into a lot of cricket conversation. I think Sachin has that. The overall theme is sports is like a great unifier, and I think uh, you can explain something which is very technical. Using a sports metaphor, and people will relate to it. And you can see how they are practicing on the field. So sports people cannot hide. You know, if you are seeing a cricket team, some okay. Sometimes you have those uh, advertisement cutaways and all that. But you see the pressure that those players are facing. You see how they are innovating. And if that's out in the public domain. Uh, we have the luxury of doing our innovations in our own comfortable zones. So if they can do it. Why can't we? You have two US patents and 10 plus patents pending, right? Congrats on that. And what's the what does the journey look forward into the future? <laughs> Thank you, Sandhya. The goal was always to solve a meaningful problem, and the patent is sort of like an outcome of it. So, you know, it's like we have to focus on the process, which is okay, are we solving the problem in the most uh, meaningful way possible? and uh, do those innovations can they make it into products that people can enjoy? So we kept the focus completely on that, and whether they make it into a pattern or not is like a byproduct which is out of our control. But yeah, I mean, when you get it, it's, it's fun. So we strive towards it, uh, and that's a message which I have for uh, especially all the startup founders. That uh, see, if you think of why a startup is formed, it's usually formed when someone is unhappy with how a problem is being solved in the market today. There, either that problem exists as a gap or the existing products are just inferior in the eyes of the founders. And so they have their own unique way of attacking that very same thing. So a startup's journey is formed on the premise of an innovation. It's going to happen regardless. So they have this edge and they have to protect that edge. And that edge comes through intellectual property rights. So patents are one way. But you can have trademarks also. You can have uh, copyrights, logos, like so many other things that could be protected. Startups end up missing out on that journey. So I've, uh, I've sort of made it a mission also of mine to educate as many startups and especially SMEs that if you are going to be innovating, please work towards protecting it because intellectual property, right, property rights are assets and they can give you numerous benefits. But in case a startup entrepreneur wants to apply for a patent or uh, there was something in your LinkedIn bio mentioned about licensees, right? So if they want your help, if the licensees want your help uh, and since you help them out, so how should they approach you and how should they go about it? So I interact with startups uh, you know, that we incubate. So for those, I, I, I am their IP mentor. Now I'm also on several societies where we've been conducting you know, workshops on intellectual property rights. But the easiest way to get started is through a completely free app called L2Pro. Okay, the letter L, the number two, Pro. It stands for Learn to Protect, Secure and Maximize Your Innovations. Uh, you'll find it on, on the different app stores or Play Store and even on the web. So it's a very easy way for any startup founder to get started on just how they should go about an IP strategy. And besides uh, me, so I just don't want to say, uh, you know, it's only me who's doing it. There's an amazing ecosystem of IP professionals in the country. 
and the biggest resource has come from the government. Uh, it's through the startup IP policy. So if someone wants to file a patent or file a trademark, they can go on the Startup India website and they can find a list of patent and trademark facilitators. Now, these are people who will file your patents and trademarks for free. They'll build the government. So the, the government has given like a variety of incentives. They've reduced the patent filing fees by 80% for startups. Uh, and you know you have these facilitators and all this information is there on the Startup India website. Thank you so much for sharing this. A lot of people, I'm sure, wouldn't be aware of this, and especially you know, getting your protection for free. And I think we live in such a great world where you know, people interact, share so much valuable information for free. And thank you so much. Really appreciate that. But sure. No, thank you to the government because they are the ones who came out with amazing programs you know, under the Startup India mission. And what's the one question that you wished somebody asked you but never did? I think people uh, tend to overestimate the difficulty in innovation. And, and you know, instead of, uh, of a lot of, lot of people ask me questions around what tool do I use, what framework do I use, all that. And instead of, if they just ask that, how do I figure out the problem to solve? I think all the, all the journeys would be, would be much simpler. Uh, because what you are, at the end of the day, no matter what, any and every one of us is doing just solving problems. You know, whether it is for your customers, whether it is for ourselves, we are solving problems. Right. Uh, but it's very hard to define you know, that problem in the simplest terms. So I think yeah, if people would ask me a question that how do I get to what I need to solve for? Right. That's, that's really interesting because I think a lot of times people get stuck when they think about innovation that I need to completely change the product from all my competitors or you know, bring in something really new, do a lot of R&D. But I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that, you know, it's the simplest thing like changing your process, the way you interact with the customers, understanding their need, maybe which the industry hasn't really focused on and then just solving that. That's also um, innovation and touching people emotionally. Agree. It's not just about looks or aesthetics, right? A lot of times people think innovation just means making it look fancy. And it's not that. I mean, we've been using, let's say, the same pencil, the same type for, I don't know, decades now. And it works. It still works. So, you know, it doesn't have to become fancier for you to use it again and again. So it's a simple innovation, uh, but so impactful. I mean, keep that in mind. Like, you know, it solves a problem in a simpler, in a, in a very simple and easy format. That's what matters to the consumer. You both are doing an amazing job inspiring SMEs and, and startups. So thank you for doing this journey. Uh, thank you for having me. It's been a great conversation. Uh, but truly, you know, like kudos to the impact that you're driving and wish you all the best. Thank you so much. much. That means a lot. Thank, thank you so much. much. I mean, uh, the information that you shared, this was really valuable starting right with the framework for design thinking to, you know, uh, helping people with the tools and the websites to protect their intellectual property. Sure. Very happy to be here. Thank you. For people who want to reach out to you, I know you conduct a lot of workshops and training sessions. So how can they enroll for it? Where do they find details about it? So best way is to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. So if you guys can share my LinkedIn profile, yeah, have that's, uh, I, I share a lot of material out, out there and that's probably the best way to know, you know, where I'll, I'll be speaking at or which workshops we are doing. Now, there are other social media platforms, but LinkedIn is where I'm the most active. And all the very best yeah. with everything, the impact that you're creating, the people you're inspiring. I really hope that, you know, a lot more people connect with you through LinkedIn for getting even more inspired. Keep on, keep at it. Thank you, Sandy. Well, this was such an amazing episode. I hope you guys got a lot of value out of the first episode with Dr. Himan Shah. If you actually enjoyed the episode, think about giving it a like and sharing it with people you think would benefit. So on that note, this is me, Karan Dharamchi, signing off for today.